the first thing God initiated between man and woman is the very thing that the devil is coming after today. The LBGT community is coming after marriage. You can't have marriage. If you want to be together, go be together. I can't tell you what to do in your own house. But when it comes to something that God ordained, the church better say something. I'm going to read you and take us into Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 16. I'll read from the King James Version. I know it has, has a lot of these and vows, and uh, it'll be a little different, but I think it'll be easier for us to understand as well as digest. Uh, because the word of God is, is, is edible, uh, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Genesis chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 16, and I'm going down to verse 19. It says, And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hath Eden of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, thou, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, and for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Those are a lot of vows and deeds in there. Uh, I want to go in and I just want to thank God this morning uh, for life, for health, for strength. Not for myself, but for us, for his people, for giving us. God, thank you for giving us a yet another opportunity to hear your word, to understand your word, and be able to live by your word because of your word. Today, I give this time to you. I give this moment of my life saying, God, you are everything. You've always been everything. And forgive me for the moments that I did not recognize that. Thank you for giving us your word to live by. Thank you for giving us life-changing, life-altering words that will help us to see who we are in your kingdom. We honor you. We magnify you. It is in Jesus' name I simply pray. Amen and amen. I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm believer in if you time, you do the time. I'm, I'm also thankful for grace and I'm thankful for mercy that some of the crimes that we've committed, we didn't have to do the time for. And, and one thing that I, that, I, that I realized is that you and I, we should, we should pay a penalty. We should because our sins come with a price tag. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but that changes everything. If you believe the gift of God is eternal life, and for us, the believer, we have uh, uh, an opportunity to receive eternal life. Genesis 3 provides us with a glimpse of the result of the first sin uh, known to mankind. The serpent, then Eve, then Adam are punished. I, I, I hear curse, but I want to refer to it as punished. Not that I'm trying to change it, but I want you to see it from a different perspective because if my children do something wrong, I don't cuss them out. Let me get some water on that one. Y'all ain't like y'all hear that one. If my children do something wrong, I don't cuss them out. I, I may have to punish them. I may have to alter their, their life for a moment so that they get an understanding of my intentions as a parent. But I don't cuss them out. So when we hear God curse, I want, to, I want to kind of rephrase it and help us to see there was more of a punishment. It was a curse, but it was more of a punishment for the choice that was made. If God had, had cursed Adam and cursed Eve, he would have, he would have altered everything because everything he created was good. And then he would have become a liar. Okay. In the first two books of, of Genesis, we realize and we understand God created all things. You do believe that, right? We talked about it last week. I believe God created the world and everything in it in, in six days. And the seventh day, he took a chill pill and 
really laid down and chilled out for a long for a day, right? Uh, we also uh, observe that God not only created all things, but he instituted marriage. Marriage was the first thing that was created with man and woman. You know, we, we've gotten into this place where we want to make everybody comfortable, but I don't believe because of what I, I read through, through documented uh, history that's been passed down over time that has not been refuted, that God created marriage for man and for woman. The, the problem is marriage for many begins as this whole blissful idea of we're going to come together and our lives are going to blend and we're going to be together forever. Or as we say in our vows, until death do we part. And, 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 and ironically, most of us in the first few years wish for death. Don't say amen. Just keep laughing. If, if we're going to last forever, why is it that over 60% of marriages just in the church where we believe in a living God? Well, we believe in an all-powerful God. Why is it that marriages inside the body of Christ are ending in divorce? Why is it that right now some of us are cringing because we're not married to the first person? And yeah, I understand extenuating circumstances. Yeah, I understand. Get out if he's beating the brakes off of you. Or if she's beating the brakes off of you. You know, times have changed. The reason that marriages aren't working is because those in the body of Christ have bought into the deceptive ways of the world. And we have subjected ourselves to its leader. And its leader is the king of all lives. Today I want to take a look and take time and, and see how this punishment changed man and woman's perspective view on marriage. It does, this does not mean that, that this altered state of punishment is a lasting effect. The marriage relationship of the believer should be different. You're still going to face some of the same obstacles. But because you are a believer, the believer not only has been redeemed, but also you have been given instructions on how to overcome for the time that is ours to share, I want to speak about the unfairy tale marriage. But the title that you can write down is simply living beyond the curse. Point number one, three things I'm going to give you that you can actually take home and hopefully study for yourself. And many of us need this, whether you're married or single, whether you're divorced, whether you're unhappy, whether you're cheating, whether you're lying, fix it. Work on it. The first thing you need to understand, this text tells us that man was divinely punished. Man was divinely punished. He said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And unto Adam, because you hearken to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. Our past experiences. How many parents in the room? Our past experiences help us to raise our children. Some of us have looked at our past and said, I'll never do this to our children. But what sometimes we fail in that instance because we fail to realize that it's the struggle that we had to go through that brought us to where we are. So when we give our children everything, we don't teach them to struggle because when you struggle, your mind turns on, your heart turns on, and you're focused on the issue at hand. But if everything is given to you, that wasn't in the notes, but you can jot that one down or watch it later. <laughs> As a result of, of making our own mistakes, 
parents drill into their children. Uh, I'm going to say this and try to try to keep it as PG as possible, but if a person is tampered with by another person as a child, then they're cautious of everybody, and they tell their children to watch out for these signs. Don't sit in anybody's lap. Don't let everybody talk to you. Don't let everybody touch you. And so they're cautious in those areas, and they, they overprotect the child. And I'm not saying you don't protect the child, but round that child out so that that child is not lopsided and looking at everybody wrong and doesn't know how to develop private great relationships. As a result, parents prepare children for worst case scenarios and leave the rest of their lives open for discussion. God, being all-knowing, was aware. He was aware that man would succumb to sin. He knew that Adam and Eve were going to make a decision. That's why the instructions were given. Of every tree that's in the garden, you can freely eat, but the tree that is in the midst of the garden, don't touch it. Don't eat from it. Lest you die. As the instruction to avoid the tree of knowledge of good and evil were given, God knew man would ultimately fall. And man did what? He directly disobeyed. It's the same thing that our children do when you tell them not to. Intrigue pops in. Ooh, I wonder what would happen. I mean, ain't nobody looking. It ain't bothering nobody. Ooh. Right? He said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply. Check the wording on this. A lot of times we just skim through the word and say we had church. But listen to what is actually said. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Stop. I will multiply your sorrow. Then, in conjunction with multiplying your sorrow, I'm going to multiply thy conception. Having babies shouldn't be that hard. But because of sin, it altered our state. We have, in this portion of the text, a sentence or a punishment that has been passed down in first he talks to the serpent. Next, he talks to, to Eve. And then we get to Adam. Because Adam held the responsibility for the stability of the home. To the woman, two things happen. A state of sorrow and a state of subjection. Sorrow covered conception, life, life issues. Every woman has some emotional things that men still don't understand. You got to say amen, say out. Let me look up some things for you. And I, I looked up the word sorrow so we can understand. Sorrow is a noun. It's characteristic feeling of sadness, of grief, or regret associated with loss, bereavement, sympathy, or another's suffering. He said, I'm going to greatly intensify your feeling of sadness, your feeling of grief, your feeling of regret in associated with being having something lost, bereavement or sympathy for another person's suffering. The Strong's Concordance define sorrow and, and and there's a word in the in the uh in the uh Hebrew it says y'all gone it's spelled y g o n y a g o n it means grief or sorrow now i want you to notice something that's very uh uh, uh interesting to me sorrow is a masculine noun i'm i'm getting at something just stay with me for a few minutes it'll perk up in a second sorrow is a masculine noun i noticed that eve is put into a state of sorrow, one in particular that is specified in bringing forth children. She is put into a state of sorrow, a state not initially designed for her. When your children cut up, you take what they cut up in and you show them 
why they shouldn't. Where Eve cut up was that God gave Adam the responsibility to cover, to keep, to dress the garden, to nurture it. But Eve had a different idea when the serpent came. She said, you know what? It is a nice tree. It's still edible. I don't see it killing nothing else. So she took the fruit. And her punishment was something that Adam was designed to handle. Since you want to step in his role, I'll give you his responsibility. And now we live in a society where women, all my ladies who still independent, your hands ain't going up now. Because here's the reality. Some of the things that we put ourselves in never belong to us. And many of us don't realize that we come to church, we let the pastor lay hands on us, the bishop, we go to all the conferences, we throw money on the stage, and we still can't get delivered from the curse. Your bills are not your problem. Your financial situation is not your problem. There is a punishment that we are under. And just because we believe, we jump, we shout, we fall out, that don't get you delivered. Obedience is the only thing. If you are willing, you know the word. And, 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 and I love this because, and I'm going to verify what I just said. Sorrow was, was given to you as a punishment, but it wasn't something that you were designed to carry. Things can bother me, and because I think logically and not emotionally, I can deal with grief. I can deal with pressure. I can deal with how things affect me or how they affect other people. Why? Because I'm wired to handle it. There are things that happen in my house and my wife will come and she will she will say, well, baby, you know, I'm worried about, I got this. That's all I need to say. It's on my list. And marriages have broken up and relationships have gone to hell because you're so busy operating in sorrow, trying to over overextend yourself, trying to make up for what you don't even know what to make up for. But it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, surely he has borne our grief and surely this sorrow that is meant for the masculine, he's carried our sorrow. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken of God, but he was wounded for our transgression. Our sorrows were never meant to be carried even by us. When, when God created man, he put the tree in the garden knowing that man was going to choose the tree. But before the foundation of the world, Jesus said, I'll cover it. Not only must we understand that, ladies and gentlemen, we are divinely punished. But secondly, I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 5, and this tells us that we have been physically repositioned. Not only have we been divinely punished, we do, we were due, we are, were owed the punishment that we received. We needed that punishment to show us that God is sovereign, that he is in control, that we don't run nothing. Don't get stuck on the punishment, though. So many people stop at the punishment. When, when, when we punish our children, they go into a funk, not realizing that the punishment was to make you aware of how to live and what not to do. So come out of the punishment for a second and realize that physically you have to be repositioned. Ladies, the air is going to leave the room. I guarantee you this. I've already prepared for it. In the case of any uh, air leaving the room, 
suction mask will come from the ceiling. Wives, verse 22, submit yourselves. Oh, I just cussed at somebody. Unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. I know the word, I'm waiting on them to fall. I'm waiting on them. I'm, I'm treading on dangerous ground. I do know that. I know we live in a day and age. My wife said something to me yesterday that 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 uh, that women are now giving their husbands their last name. Really? Really? This is not going to happen. Not here. Not here. <laughs> the word of God is very specific. I don't have to go in and add to it or take nothing out to give you something special. The Bible says wives, 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 submit to your husbands. This scripture is specific for those who have picked up the mantle to be a wife. This is specific to those who have accepted the responsibility to not only take his last name, but take everything that comes with it. This ain't for girlfriends. This ain't for baby mamas. This ain't for jump offs. The Bible says, wives, fellas, pause, park. Man, my girlfriend won't submit. She ain't supposed to. She's not supposed to. No ringy. Oh, I'm sorry. There is a, a privilege. There is a privilege to being a wife. Don't let real housewives fool you. How can you be on real housewife and you ain't a wife? There's a privilege to being a wife to a man who submits to the Lord. Notice what I just said. To a man who submits himself to the Lord. There's a privilege. You want to know what the privilege is? You get to submit. Now, I know half y'all want to cuss me out, but let me finish. Please. I promise you, you'll like me in a few minutes. I promise you. Hear me out. Let's take a moment to understand what submit actually means. I know that submit means to come under the authority of, and that's one perspective. But here's the thing. Submit also means to turn over what belongs to his rightful owner. When you're in school, you write a paper, the teacher says, turn your papers in. That means that you submit to them. Wives, here's your privilege. Not only do you submit and come under the authority, but you take the sorrow or the pressure of the curse and you give it back to your husband because he takes the pressure off of you so that you can walk in the anointing and the power that God has for you without the curse, without the pressure. So don't let him drag you along for six years. A man, when he sees a gift of God, should take it, not let it collect dust. We have, we have, because of this situation that our society is, we've, we've, we've changed our perspective on marriage, where most men don't want to be married. Anybody need a, y'all need a towel. I see some sweating going on out here. Most men don't want to commit. It's, why, why buy the cow when you're getting the milk for free? Then you want to change when the, when the milk dry up. Then you want to just go buy a ring to buy you some time so that you can keep. The 
wife is to submit to her husband the permission to release her from the curse given in the garden. It seems easy. It sounds good, Doug. But the reality of it is, I like the way I live. I'm independent, not, not just because Beyonce sang. I'm independent because I like living the way I live. I don't want to have nobody tell me what to do. If we get married, we're going to have to have an understanding. Who's quiet here today? They're going to think I'm talking to myself. She's fighting for her will and, and everything that causes her to feel independent. But let's take a look at what scripture says. In, in, in Ephesians 5, 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be subject to their husbands. Fellas, you got to get right. Fellas, you got to do more than just come to church on Sunday. It is not Doug's responsibility to teach your family. It is not Doug's responsibility to proclaim the word of God to your wife and your children. I take the pressure off me. Churches are filled today with people who are energized because of the word, but go back to nothingness. And people still want that. And they pay for it. And they pay for it. But when you're out of order, there's no return on your payment. You just, you just throwing money away. It's like investing in broken things. There's no value. And, and here's the thing. The first thing God initiated between man and woman is the very thing that the devil is coming after today. The LBGT community is coming after marriage. You can't have marriage. You want to be together, go be together. I can't tell you what to do in your own house, but when it comes to something that God ordained, the church better say something. We're allowing too much stuff. Not only must we understand we've been divinely punished, I know that's a tough one, but we've been physically repositioned, and lastly, we've been spiritually ordered. We've been spiritually ordered. Verse 25, Ephesians 5. Husbands, not baby daddies, not them thugs that just drop by from nine to time to time, but a man who is a man becomes the husband of his wife. Ladies say amen, it's okay. Say amen, you got that. You made me mad earlier, but thank you for saying something good. Husband, this is, make note, the, note the tone of this text. It's a command. It is, it is not, there is no choice. If you become a husband, here is your order. Here are your orders. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loves the church. We can preach right there all day, because here's the thing. The church out of order, but everybody going to heaven. The church out of order, but we all in the will of God. We're not preaching the word of God. We're not leading anybody to God. We're leading them to us, and they're serving us, but they're not serving the king of kings. And just even as the church, Christ also loved the church, he gave himself for the church. You husbands are not even on the list when it comes to the need of your home. They come first. Your wife, if all you got is 15% of an emotional connection, she gets all of it. And you grow that 
and you work on that. I'm not telling you something that I haven't had to work on. Some days I've only had 38%. And I didn't know what to do with it. So I gave it. Some days I'm high. I'm at 75 and I feel good. And I give it. Whatever you have, even if you don't understand it, the Bible commands you to love your wife. Why? Verse 26, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. I know our homes are in disarray, but it's the word of God that's going to clean them. It's the word of God that's going to fix them. That it might present itself to him a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. Eight, a punishment. A punishment is usually issued for a crime committed in hopes of altering the way a person's attitude is taken towards life. Now, I want you to note the, the total extreme. Adam went from having full dominion to being fully dominated. I'll give you scripture. Genesis chapter 1. Y'all, Doug, you normally just stay in one chapter. Not today. We got work to do. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. That's a whole nother message. And to the beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth on the earth, there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and so it was. Remember God said, I give a man dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and every creeping thing that creepers on, on the face of the earth. He went from that to being fully dominated. And unto Adam he said, because you hearkened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. I just said God can't curse what he already blessed. Everything God created in the first six days he said was good. So if he cursed Adam, God would have become a liar. And I preach so many times and it just slips by. God said cursed Adam is the ground. Adam came from the ground. But when God breathed life into Adam, he was no longer dirt. He was alive. So, Adam, I'm going to curse what you used to be so that you no longer return to what you used to be. But that as you see the promise that I've taken care of you, even in your unrighteousness, that you'll give your life to me, that you'll take care of your family that you'll love your wife, that you'll love your children, that you'll provide for them, even in this changed state of mind. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face, Adam, prior to the curse, prior to the punishment, didn't have to work for his food. There was a there was a firmament, a, a canopy over, over the world that, that kept the, the moisture in the air. The, the ground was moist. There was water coming out of the ground. Everything grew, and you didn't have to work to get it out. You know, when, when the ground is, is, is fallow, when it's hard, you have to go in and you dig and hope don't hit no pipe, don't hit no pipe, call for you dig, you know, just the service announcement. But you go in there and dig, and it's, it's like you get in, and it should be easy because you 230, see? And uh, you, you, you can dig down in there, but it's a lot of work. But when Adam, prior to his, his punishment, he can go in and say, hey, I'll take this. But because of sin, our work, double, triple, quadruple. The effort we have to put into everything. It ain't just the black man that got to work a hundred times harder. It's all of us. It's all of us. And we 
have so much to overcome. And here's the thing. If we take our energy that we're putting out trying to please everybody out in the world, putting out all of our energy trying to please the boss man, trying to please the neighbor, trying to please the folk down the street, trying to please and, and be all of this, they're all that you can be. And we just come home and put that energy in our homes. Love your wife. Love your children. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's going to be hunky-dory every day. I am saying you're going to have some struggles. I am saying you're going to have some fights. Learn how to fight fast. Stop pushing buttons. Stop making phone calls. Stop calling names. The stuff, the stuff we fight over is so small when you realize the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that we stand together in the power and the dominion that God called and ordained for us. Once we stop living under the curse, once we stop subjecting ourselves, once, once the wife comes in and says to the husband, I no longer want this pressure. Release me from it. Take this off of me. Now, what do we do to the Savior? God is your husband. Take your problem to him. We've all, the penalty for your sin has already been paid. That may mean some life changes. That may mean some people get cut off. That may mean some services get cut off. And I wasn't just talking to the ladies. I said send it. We, you, I can't define what the services are, but you kind of read between the lines. And when we get to the place that we subject, because even as husbands, in order for our homes to get right, we got to get right. We got to stand before God one day. He's going to ask not how well you serve in the community, not how well you look in the nation, but in, that four, in the four walls of your home, how well did you serve? Did you let her attitude make you stop loving her? Even as Christ loved the church, the church is jacked up and he still loves us. We are a mess, a wreck undone. But what Jesus has decided to do is the same thing that husbands have to listen to what I said, decide to do. You wash her with the water of the word. You cover her with the water of the word. That means you get into the word and you become stronger. Break the myth that men don't know enough spiritually. Get in the word of God. Let it build you up. And when you get into the word of God, it'll bring peace into your life because you now, sir, submit to God. And as you submit to God, she sees that you submit to God. As you submit vertically, there's submission that happens horizontally. And she hands over the pressure back to you, and you give it to God. I'm not going to stand before you. My wife will tell you there's pressure in our home every day. But because I said, God, you're in control, what do you want to do? How do you want us to be used? It opens the door for the pressure to have direct line to him. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man cleave, leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. You married the umbilical cord should have been cut, burnt, clipped, blown up, and buried. Some of us fellas, we still love mama more than wife. That's got to stop. My wife and my mom, I told them, ain't no, ain't no fighting over there. That don't happen. Here's the order. That's my wife. And it's respected because I set the tone. Mama, let him go. The air left the room. I'm still waiting on. 
this is a great mystery. The Bible is telling us this is this is a great mystery, and it's it's concerning marriage. And if we can figure out marriage, we'll understand Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, love his wife as himself. I don't care how mean and evil and spiteful she can be. Love her. I don't care how crazy and deranged he is. Love him. Because my Bible tells me this, that love covers a multitude of sins. And I don't know a perfect person save Jesus. So I challenge us today. I know this message is different. I know it incited a riot inside of you. And some of you are thinking, like, I don't like this. I don't appreciate it. But if you learn to appreciate this, then you'll value your relationship with God. Because my choice is to do whatever it takes to see him. My choice is to leave and cleave and make sure that I get this right. Because I don't want to do all of this preaching all of this jumping, all of this hooping and hollering, and then go to hell because my marriage jacked up. So I get what's important. I found out that here's the mystery. If I treat home right, I take care of my wife, I love her, I give her not just things, but I give her what she needs. What she needs is to submit to me the things that I can handle that God designed for me. Not just sit up under me and do what I say, because you a jerk, sir. You can meet me in the parking lot. And I guarantee you it ain't going to be fun. But she submits to my authority as a leader who is submitted to God. And it changes the perspective of my home. I can guarantee you this. I can honestly guarantee you this. The life that I grew up living has been altered when my relationship got right with God and my children don't have to suffer some of the same things that I suffered. Because God comes first. Then it's my wife. Then it's my children. Everything else, it'll come. It'll happen. Seek first the kingdom. The first thing that was instituted for man was a job responsibility, and it was marriage. Fellas, stop waiting. What you scared of? You see her, you like a holler at her. You still got games, just do it the right way. Go with respect. Go and find out who she is. Investigate. Follow. To pursue her. Don't let a good one get away. Let the crazy ones go. This has been your public service announcement. Lord, I thank you. Your word is sometimes hard to digest, but necessary because everything that's sweet, everything that's loving ain't always good for us. I thank you for giving us today what we need to ratify and to justify and to overcome the obstacles in a marriage, in a home, to prepare even singles to recognize who you are, who to look for, who to become. Father, I bless you. I magnify you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.